Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season with your host, Lisa, that's me, and Venkat. Um, today we're talking about form. Um, so to kick it off, I've got a couple of, I wanted to show off a couple of forms that I spend my time with on a day-to-day basis, which are some chairs that I have, like office chairs. Yeah, so I only, I guess I really only have like three. Um, the first is the one I'm sitting in, which is, oh, wow, okay. The first is the one I'm sitting in, which is actually like, my favorite chair. I think you can see it in the background. Here, let me like pick this up. It's gonna be super whatever. Um, so this is the chair that I'm sitting in. It's just a normal, um, what do you call it? Uh, like four, four, uh, like a dining room chair. It's a normal yeah. dining room chair. But mm-hmm. what I really like about this chair, in particular, this form in particular, um, is that it shows up. It's like. I bought it off of Craigslist from a wedding planner. And so you can see it in a lot of movies and like, cause it's used in sets or for the 2016 um, presidential inauguration, it was the chair that was used to lay out the <laughs> event. Uh, so one of my so favorite- So it's a Trumpy things, chair. I saw it was golden, right? So it's kind of like got a golden- Yeah, glitter. it's gold. It's These a very Trumpy old. chair. And so the paint is kind of, you can see one in the background there behind uh-huh. me. The paint is chipping off them and they kind of look like fake bamboo. Um, but yeah, so one of my favorite things to do with this particular form factor of chairs, spot it in news clippings or like pictures of weddings or event planning spaces because mm-hmm. it pops up a lot. Um, cool. Moving onward. The, uh, so I've, I have four chairs I'll show off today. This one's the first one. It's just a normal dining chair that shows up everywhere. Uh, this next one you can see here to my left. Um, this is a one of my, it's a kneeling chair. So let me see if you can actually see. Yep, stage it's right. Got kneeling pads on it. But what makes this one a little bit different than a normal kneeling thing is it also has this kind of funky T-shaped back to it. Um, it's a Varrier That's It Belongs. I get, I've gotten questions questions about it before. Um, but the whole, the basic idea between this and the next show, the next chair that I'll show you, which is also a very rare chair, um, is that they're really, sp- they're really attempting to change where your center of gravity is. So the thing with the kneeling chairs is that you're, they're trying to tilt your pelvis forward. Mm-hmm. Um, so moving your, it's a, you know, it's funny cause it's like chairs are like a form that changes your physical form in real life. Um, usually with the, uh, end goal of trying to make your body hurt less (laughs) after a day of sitting um right so kneeling chairs um a lot of them don't have the back i like this one because you can kind of lean back um i don't know what that does necessarily to your ergonomics it's probably not as good for you but um i find that i can spend more time in it Um, it reminds me of some pieces of gym equipment like uh, certain weight benches you can sort of tuck your feet under like uh yeah so it kind of looks like that yeah, it is like that basically. You you bend your knees and you hook you basically mm-hmm. are kneeling on the little pads. Um cool. So then the other chair that I have is here on my other side. I don't know if you can we can't see it, so you'll have to show the camera. All right, there we go. There we go. It's uh it's like a saddle thing and it wobbles. So when you sit on it, it wobbles around. Um and again, this is kind of more of a standing chair size, but or stool, I guess. It's more of a stool than a chair. But the whole idea is that you um, lean forward and so your weight is, um, one, you're engaging your core to stay balanced because it wobbles. And then the Mm -hmm. other is that it, um, again, tilts your pelvis forward or backwards or whatever direction is the correct direction so that you're um, kind of putting your weight more evenly on your spine instead of slumping backwards or whatever. So um, this is uh, somewhere between what? a rocking chair and a balance ball, right? So like an exercise yeah, balance exactly. ball and a rocking chair. Okay. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So it becomes in a fancy form factor. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> can you show us the uh, rocking part? That part is not visible. We can only see the saddle part. Uh, yeah, I can pick it up. I wanted to show, hang on, let me back up a bit. Um, let's see. Uh, it's just the oh, bottom okay. of it is kind of slightly curved. It's hard to see. Okay. But it's yeah. got a, um, I can see the curve. Leg. Yeah, I just wanted to see how extreme the curve was and whether it was closer to a ball or a rocking chair or what. So it's like a mild curve. Yep. Mild curve. But this one, so this is the last one I wanted to show. This is not a chair, but it's actually a, um, it's a board that you stand on. So um, it's just like flat, like kind of like a skateboard. And mm-hmm. it's got a bump on the bottom with two things so you stand out and you wobble back and forth yep 
which isn't really a chair, but when I do the stand, I have a, my desk moves up and down. So when I stand up, I stand on it and kind of wobble. Um, yeah, so again, I think it's just that whole structure. keeping your core engaged is like the main of the, of the four that I've shown, the main goal of three of them is to keep your core engaged. Um, gives better outcomes. So what's your ranking in terms of like how often you use them? Uh, yeah, totally. So I used to actually use this one on the left, the, um, the kneeling chair the most. Um, for some reason, I switched back to the one I'm in now. So I've been using the sit down chair the most. Um, this one I use probably third frequently. And then I don't really stand up as much as I should. So I use this one the least frequently. I, I wish I stood up more because it really does help a lot. I just get lazy or something. Um, find it hard. It's funny. I find it hard to concentrate when I'm not comfortable. So no, that's quite, it's an interesting hobby because cool. chairs are so bulky. Like uh, I have uh, just a regular office chair. It's, it's a uh, somewhat high end. I think it's in, uh, we have one Aeron that my wife uses and this one is, uh, I forget the brand name, but it starts with a Z and we got the floor model uh, for cheap. So this wasn't, I think is worth like 600 bucks. So it's a good office chair, but it's not special. And, uh, but, but the interesting thing about me is um, pretty much whatever I sit on, unless there's a reason like decorum not to, I sit cross-legged. And I think it's because I grew up sitting cross-legged a lot. And India is like basically cross-legged country. And when I think about something funny, uh, two anecdotes occur to me. One is that um, in medieval times, people didn't have chairs, like even really rich people, like 14th century Europe, uh, the main piece of furniture they had was a bed. Everybody, if you wanted to do something that was not standing, you'd be sitting on a bed. And I was thinking about India where if you look at like old paintings and stuff, there's nothing that looks like a chair, like even King's thrones and stuff. They're not really like chairs. They have such huge seats that you can tell you're intended to sit cross-legged on the seat itself. You're not mm -hmm. supposed to let your feet dangle. So I think chairs are actually kind of interesting. They, they literally, somebody had to like think, oh, I want to actually sit in a way where my legs can actually dangle off and stuff. So it's, it's not necessarily a natural kind of uh, sitting device. But, uh, all right, so that's your show and tell of chairs, right? Yeah, and then you had some forms that you wanted to show off. Yours yes. are a little bit of a sharper. <laughs> yeah, so my uh, show and tell is knives. So I just collected knives around the house. Mm. All right, so I'm going to go from um, simple to the most exotic. So the first one is a basic kitchen paring knife, three and mm. a half inch shabu stuff. And even this, like we actually took a knife um, skills class there's some skill to using this stuff um, in a more effective way. But anyway, basic starting point, basic knife, thousands of years of evolution from like a stone air, stone chip tool, right? Mm -hmm. Staying with the kitchen, a cheese knife. So I don't use this very often and it took, I just had to Google to find out what the holes are for. I was assuming that the holes are for measuring, measuring pasta, but apparently I'm wrong. The holes are to reduce friction for cutting cheese. And this is apparently a fork to just eat like that. So um, that seems mm. dangerous to me, but okay. So cheese knife is my number two form. It looks like it's it's been Swissed. What do you mean Swissed? Like Swiss cheese has holes in it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, this one kind of has the same two pronged fork mm. um, as a cheese knife, but this is not a cheese knife. This is the Wooster 4109, I think. And it's marketed as a, a tomato and vegetable knife, so soft fruit, because mm -hmm. soft fruit for some reason seem to cut better with a serrated knife, and so that's what this is. And the interesting, this, yeah. Oh, I thought the serration was to get through the skin. Yeah, so it gets through the skin better of soft fruit, right? So, like if you were doing a potato, you could do a potato easily with this, but if you're doing a tomato and you do it with that one, it'll squash it. The interesting thing I just noticed about this is. Most knives have like a 22 and a half degree, like, um, you know, 45 degree at the bottom kind of edge. This one is single edged. If you, uh, you can't see it edge on, but mm -hmm. you can see that, let's see, this side, the serration looks weaker. This side should look stronger. I don't know how well it's, or sorry, this is weaker. And this, it should be clearer. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's asymmetric. So that's something to notice. Though the cheese yeah. knife was symmetric. All right, number three. At some point, somebody must have decided to put two knives together to make scissors, right? So scissors are basically two knives pinned together. 
and again, they're um, asymmetrical, like one edge is flat and the other mm -hmm. edge has the bevel. All right, number four. Is it number four, number five, actually? So I think one knife is worth, uh, or two knives equals one chair. Ooh, do I even have a knife in this one? Oh, yeah. So this is a basic, very tiny Swiss army knife. The kind oh, that so goes tiny. on your, yeah. Can't even get this. Let me get the nail file off, yeah. It's a tiny Swiss army knife. It goes on your key ring. It's a form factor as in attaches to a key ring mm -hmm. and- uh, Highly well, portable, yeah. Yeah, uh, but it is the base tool in a bunch of tools. Let me pull them all out. So this is like a platform which is dominated by, I think it's only got these three things in it. So, oops, it's got a nail file, a knife mm. and scissors. So, scissors, more scissors. Those more are cute scissors. scissors, yeah. But most Swiss army knives, the knife is the basic one. And the last one I have to show is, I kind of like it. I just got this, inherited it from my father-in-law who passed away recently, Leatherman. So oh. I find this interesting because for the Leatherman, the sort of uh, marquee tool, the main tool is the pliers and the knife is kind of like um, a second fiddle kind of thing, right? Yeah, I didn't realize they had a knife in them. Wow, okay. So the way Leatherman tools work is, yeah, the main thing looks like um, pliers, uh, but each I of see. these wings kind of comes up and there's like 10 tools in there. I'm not going to take oh. them all out, but yeah. So oh, I see, okay. So, so it's like a, a fancy Swiss army knife. Uh, no, there are, the Swiss army knife I showed happened to be not so fancy with just three tools, but I have another Swiss army knife that's like as fancy as this Leatherman. I think the difference is a Swiss army knife, the knife is the main sort of lead character. Whereas mm -hmm. for a Leatherman, the pliers are the lead character and the knife is like the best supporting actor or something. Which kind of uh, leads into the, um, the, you know, so the most famous quote that I, I know of regarding form factors is form follows function, mm -hmm. um, which comes from architecture world. I just looked this up on Wikipedia. I don't remember who the guy is who coined it, but it was an architect, I want to say in the early 1900s. Um, and the idea is that the shape of the item will be based on what it is that you require it to do. So I guess in the case of a Leatherman, the most important fact function was the plier aspect mm -hmm. of it, right? Whereas I guess this was army knife, it's the knife. Yep. So it's, a, it's like, if you think about it, platforms and apps, it's what's the killer app on the platform. So for the Leatherman, the killer app is the pliers and for the Swiss Army knife, it's the knife. Uh, but, but even like things that are not obvious platform multi-tools, um, I mean, this, a cheese knife, um, <laughs> you could use the holes for measuring pasta, but the prong part, like the fork tip, that's, it's a fork, right? So it's at least two functions, yeah. right? And of course, you can use knives as a flat thing to crush garlic or something. So, well, not that one, but not that one, <laughs> but other ones. Uh, yeah. So, your to your point, form follows function. It reminds me of two other principles I like a lot. Mm -hmm. One is uh, structure follows strategy, which is Alfred Chandler, a management consultant guy, who's basically like companies. Um, their the strategy they pursue is a function of like the structure they have. So like, you know, a decentralized structure will have like a decentralized strategy kind of uh, thing. And another related principle is what's known as Conway's law of software. So this is actually relevant to you software engineers, which is uh, product structure follows um, organization structure. And the classic example is if you have um, a four team organization building a compiler, you're gonna get a four pass compiler. So the basic idea is like, the structure of teams and their structure of communications, it's going to roughly map to the architecture of the product. So both I think are like special cases of form follows function. I wanted to make a meta point about how the, what is it, strategy follows structure? Is that, is that the thing? Strategy, strategy follows structure. Follows strategy. Structure both follows are kind of true, it's a chicken and egg thing. Okay, I was gonna say, but using that as, the, as a management consultant, like the form of your dictum being like a, copying it already existent extant um thing makes it even more memorable so like the form of your dictum being like follow is so the form of the dictum is the is a mimic of form follows function um ah, which is yep. 
mimicking like he put it in that copycat manner such that it would i'm assuming i'm making some assumptions here but such that other people yeah. would remember it and it would be memorable because it also is in this little category so really in that cool. case i it's like such a commonplace construct of three words that i'm not sure he would have mimicked that particular one but in general that's true and there's a word for it uh, snow clones you, you heard the term snow clones so snow clones no. is when you take a famous saying and just replay something so one of my favorites is mm -hmm. arthur c clark's uh, line that uh, sufficiently advanced technologies indistinguishable indistinguishable from magic and yeah. people keep coming up with variants of that do i like our sufficiently advanced technologies in, indistinguishable from uh, nature and mm -hmm. sufficiently mm -hmm. advanced work is indistinguishable from play so the, in that uh, case i can see that your meta point about form following function in the template of a phrase the snow clone effect that would be true mm. yep yeah, it's fun. That's cool. So, it, going us the going along on this topic of um, of you know expression, you also wanted to take form to a different place, not just from everyday objects like chairs and knives, but into um, kind of the written written words. So, like specifically, there's like long form and short form. Mm -hmm. um, and we we've been having a conversation between ourselves about what format uh, a podcast works best for us. Like we've been trying to do shorter episodes this season. Last season we had more long rambling things. Um, yeah, but maybe we should start with like fiction. So like I've been or like just like with written stuff. You're a long form blogger. Um, yeah, and uh, I've been experimenting with fiction, and you are kind of uh, you do a, all of it, but you've been writing a fiction newsletter, right? And I just got your um, issue from yesterday. The future side issue about like a weird calendar future fiction in Mexico, right? So yeah, yeah. it's based in Mexico. That was a fun story, um, by the way. Yeah, everybody should go read that. All right, so <laughs> what do you have to say about form? Oh yeah, so I find, I find short form really, not easy, but yeah, short form is really easy for me. So I can write a short story like the one I sent out really quickly. It doesn't take me very much time to knit something like that together. Um, whereas I really struggle with anything that like is longer than like a couple pages. Um, like in college, I had to do 20 page papers for some of my stuff. And like, I was just, actually in college, I was supposed to write a thesis. Um, I was in a, I was in an undergrad program, one of the few at my university that required theses from undergraduates. Um, and I ended up completely bailing on that. I did everything in the major except write, <laughs> write. Oh, there were two things I didn't do. I didn't write my thesis and I didn't take the one physics class I was supposed to take, um, which in retrospect, I kind of regret. I probably would have really liked the physics class. But um, yeah, anyway, so long form is something I've always, I just like really struggle with. It's just a lot of huh. focus. So I think mine is the opposite. It's short form I struggle with. Like it's really like, um, hard for me to go below about 1500 words um, in a nonfiction. But uh, there's like this, uh, I, I guess, Badlands Valley between, I guess, 15 to 20 words and 1500 words. Like Twitter is very comfortable for me. Like, um, like if you treat aphorisms as the shortest kind of short form, like a tweet length little thing, I, I like that. I'm, I, I think I'm good at it and I can mm. play Twitter well. But between, had, to be fair, some of your some of your threads are much longer. You have some of the longest and most drawn out threads on a consistent. Yeah, basis but those are threads. But I also have individual okay. tweets. Yeah, I think I have a bunch of like individual aphoris aphorism tweets, right? But yeah, yeah I, I find it hard yeah, to true. go between, like, say, a short thread length of like uh, ten to fifteen tweets to fifteen hundred words. In between, like, if you asked me to write a six hundred word short story, I would really struggle. Whereas I think that's your sweet spot, right? Yeah, or at least I don't really think that much about it. I just do it. It happens. Like, huh. So length is one aspect of form. And mm -hmm. uh, the knives I showed ranged in length from like an inch and a half to I think five, six inches. And the biggest knife I have is the regular kitchen knife of eight inches. So there's a, almost an order of magnitude range in length in knives. And for fiction, I think, yeah, a, a fat book is about 100,000 words, like history, history fiction tends to reign at around 100 to 120,000 words. Yeah, and yeah. short, short stories, probably 1,500 words. Yeah. And Most short please, stories yeah. are longer than the short fiction I sent out on my newsletter. Your short fiction, I don't know that I would even call it fiction because it, it, it reminds me of uh, Borges. 
So some of it looks like uh, vignettes that are like, you know, uh, magic realist impressionist uh, sort of uh, impressions, right? Yeah, they're based on um, a Brazilian short story format called Chronicas, which are about the same length as like a, I want to say like a, they fit on like a page in a, um, a magazine. So what did you, is that where you picked up a taste for that length? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I took a lot of literature classes in college that were all Brazilian lit. And you were reading these in original Portuguese? Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting because they reminded me of Borges, who's Spanish and Argentinian, Mm -hmm. but I'm guessing there's like enough closeness somehow that maybe there's some relation there. Huh. I, I don't know. I've tried, but I can't get anything good down in the 600 to 1500 word range. Yeah, I'm actually wondering if you're right about, like, because I did read, I just spent a lot of time with short fiction in college, like, reading it. And maybe, I think to a certain extent, like, you do get the cadence down or, like, kind of the idea. Yeah, of I've read a lot. I enjoy reading it. Like, um, O. Henry, Gidi, Maupassant, Chekhov, Borges, all of them are very short. Those are, are all short. longer. Their short stories are all longer, aren't they? I think Chekhov is pretty, sh- some of them are pretty short. I mean, they've written longer ones, too. But the range is all over, I think. Mm. Uh, but yeah, maybe not. Maybe not as short as the Brazilian ones because I haven't read those. But Borges tends to be pretty mm. short. Like some bits of Borges are like a couple of pages. And, and I think my short stories, the ones I've written and successfully like actually put out there, they are, the minimum is probably 3,000 words. Like that's the minimum length I need to tell a story. What else? But you're, like so, telling, but you're telling a story, right? Like... Yeah, I mean, with a proper arc, like there's a yeah. protagonist who's like facing a conflict and then they resolve the conflict. So uh, nothing special, but yeah, it's not impressionistic um, yeah, sketches or something. Impressionistic. Yeah, I would say because I don't really feel like men have like, like, there's definitely a story there, but it's like, they're like, it's almost like a taking a snapshot, right, of a situation. Yeah, you, you had in your newsletter a few longer arcs, right? I forget what's her name, the and there was one character whose story you were following across like four or five episodes yeah, and then I you just, abandoned. It's, I still need to write the last one. Um, I can't remember her name anymore. I'd have to go look it up. <laughs> that tells but... you how much you care for that character. Well, the last one was going to be like a really point. It was, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I don't know. Well, so like the, originally like the way that I was like laying it out is I wanted to do one every year. So they're going to be 50, one every week. So they're going to be 52. And so I actually like plotted out there were a couple storylines that I wanted to like weave in and out throughout the year. Um, and I wanted like certain events to match up with what was going on in real life. So her last, um, oh, her name's Mars. I think it was Mars. Oh yeah, um, Mars, yeah. Like Mars plays the first stage. So she's like a performer and she's like yeah. playing different stages. Um, but I guess I can kind of give it away, but they're actually like the five stages of grief and she's, she's grieving um she was a black woman who turned white like unexpectedly and so she goes from being like uh anyways and it's kind of her dealing with like suddenly becoming a white human and like going through the, like her the communities like what happened to you um did you do this like what did you do and it's just some like freak thing that happened anyways um and the last one was actually gonna be over I want to say I had picked like Lollapalooza or like some big music conference like some big conference some big music festival um weekend and so I was planned to do the uh release that last segment the same weekend that the big music festival was happening but then the festivals Mm -hmm. got canceled so (laughs) I didn't follow through good story Uh, Uh, so you have one more part to write that you will you do plan to finish this though yeah, I should. I really should. Though, like, it kind of lost the deadline. <laughs> huh. I also had some other, I had a whole other plot line that dealt with Congress, and so I had planned some of the plot lines around when Congress went on recess. Um, so, like, looked up the congressional recess calendar and kind of had stuff planned around that. Stuff. So, I think there's a theme here, and uh, I've done similar things, but the um, sort of meta point I'm seeing here is it's often, so this is like um, the form and function kind of thing. It's often useful to pick a form to conform to that gives Mm -hmm. fiction a structure, right? So in this case, you pick the five stages of grief, right? And other people use different things like the Fantastic Four um, apparently is the characters are based on the elements like, you know, earth, fire, water, wind. Mm -hmm. That's how you get the Fantastic Four uh, characters. Um, You can get more arbitrary, like the first 
uh, short story I ever wrote, I just used the alphabet like um, our podcast. So I had like 26 sections A to Z. And if I remember correctly, what I did was pick a song that um, started with each letter and a, a verse from the song was the sort of anchor piece of each section. It worked pretty well. And uh, it's, it's surprising how far you can get with just about any arbitrary form gives you sort of the scaffolding needed to write a story. Like, yeah. and this is like, I'm talking about like, I'm not talking about scaffoldings like um, Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey type. That's like narrative theory, which I don't find that useful. Mm, but something yeah. much more arbitrary, right? Like, like you could write a story, like I have an apartment with a bedroom, living room, kitchen, bathroom, mm -hmm. right? So you could write a story based on like those four as the structural elements, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. And I mean, like the last story I just sent out this week is based around like calendar shenanigans. Mm -hmm. Like it's the, the whole kind of just, well, the narrative structure is like around what would happen if you switched to a the 13th month um, Eastman calendar. So to be honest, when I read that, I was actually jealous. Like it's, um, I felt like, shit, I should have thought of this story idea. Like, oh. uh, <laughs> it is a really fun premise. And uh, honestly, I think uh, that would work for a longer story. Like it was a little too short. I would like that premise worked out. I don't know. You could build Almost a like whole a little... you you could build a whole like universe around just that, mm -hmm. right? Like yep. yeah, it's got that it's got the seed there. Yeah. Somebody was telling me about an entire science fiction like a space opera built around uh, calendars. I I'll have to look up the reference again and um, share it. But uh, yeah, so big premise there. All right. So what else? Do we have more thoughts on form cool. and function? No, I, I don't think so. Um I don't know. I forgot I haven't been keeping track of time, but might be time to wrap up. Yeah. All right. So that's our form and function episode with chairs and knives and stories and some <laughs> philosophy. Some philosophy. Yeah. Great. What's next? So we F, uh, G. G will be next. I guess we'll have to figure out what to talk about next. Oh, um, yeah. So F was easy. About... Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I, I think can... uh, what we're trying to do, like uh, we've made the format shorter at 35 minutes now and now we're trying to like blend a show and tell and a philosophy theme so let's see like if we can pull off something with I that like gears yeah. gods um i don't know all right yeah let's brainstorm something for g pick something out sounds okay. good great all right thank you always a pleasure uh talk always to you next pleasure. week all right Bye. scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh smoke and screws the premium filter for your glass pipes water pipes and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.